Let's just talk through what um, we're seeing when we when we mean or what we mean when we say the live action situation. Um, specifically, the shutdown that's taken place um, is not allowing groups to meet greater than 10 people. Um, some places that's up to 20, but um, most of the states, it seems like it's um, 10 people. In the San Francisco area, they're in shutdown mode. So you can't even be out on the street without um, going directly to a store or your place of business. Um, so clearly the, the type of services live action provides where people have to congregate together, they do things in large groups, um, all of that is canceled or pushed one way or another. If that's your primary business, that means you are, you're experiencing a certain amount of work that's just drying up. Um, and I would have guessed that the fact that we can't really anticipate when this is going to be over, like we don't, you know, it might be 10 days, it might be 30 days. We're, we're hearing the mixed messages from different government entities and, and leaders telling us how long it's going to be. Um, we believe there's an extra amount of stress on you. So we just wanted to deal specifically with what that means to actually be shut down or feel shut down with the services you provide. Um, if, I, if I've said that right, part of what I want to be able to do also is just open up this conversation to get a greater understanding of what Joel and I might be missing and what these angles are. Um, but let's just, I just wanna present the beginning of like, what does, what does shutdown mean? Um, one of the things that we promote inside of RevThink is sales doesn't solve all problems. And, and what really what that means is, is that the issues that you have in the moment um, are, can, are finite. We, we can look at them as an overall picture, recognize the revenue we have in place, the cash that we have on hand, the resources that we work with, and know the mix of those three things in order to keep the business going, uh, leverage things towards the future. One of my concerns on your behalf is that if you have retained some accounts receivable or some cash, you're gonna to have to use that now just to maintain operation. And then the money you need in the future isn't there when you need to leverage other items in the future. Um, what we wanna be able to do is give you hope that like it doesn't mean you have to shut down completely and shutter the doors. Although if you're on the edge of doing that and this is the item that tips you over, we completely understand you've done nothing wrong. Sometimes timing in life has that and you just kind of shutter the doors on things. But those of you who are working through this, through these obstacles, um, we want to start thinking about like, what are, what are the finite elements that we know we can work with? Um, and then I'd like to have a conversation about like maybe some positive attributes, but I'm going to be very sensitive because what I've been hearing and kind of just, uh, gets me the wrong way is almost like, well, why can't live action people just, and then like fill in the blank, just turn to augmented reality or simply, you know, adjust to the changing needs. Well, these changing needs are 48 hours old for some of us. We weren't at all expecting them. It wasn't a long-term strategy that we're playing ourselves out and there's a practical reality of what's going on. So um, to be able to talk about some practical stuff for you and then give you some understanding of what to do with it. Um, I'd like to try to do that or let's just say begin that conversation in the next 20 minutes. Joel, um, what are your thoughts on, on these, where these business owners are? Well, I like, I like that you were being sensitive, first of all, to don't, let's not be glib with each other. And also for those of you out there that are in animation and motion, yes, clearly you're in a place where you do have an advantage over live action people that have to bring together crews and bring people together and social dis distancing obviously doesn't make that workable. Um, I think I'm, I'm seeing this question that Diana Dixon, you just posted this note here, and this is a very real example, right, Tim? I don't, I don't know if you saw this. We have these two yeah, potential shoots we've been asked to do, where they might be canceled or postponed. Is there any language that you recommend to get paid up front? And, you know, generally speaking, the problem is, even though you might have a piece of paper, what does that even mean? It, it just means that the client could say, well, sorry, it just didn't work out. Sue me. You know, I'll, if you want to take me to court, I guess you can. So even getting the language in an agreement doesn't just doesn't guarantee. Now, to your point, Tim, I will say this. I learned the lesson you're describing the hard way. And that is we have costs that we can control, such as our, our people, uh, our equipment. Maybe some of us can control our rent. 
other expenses. And then we have something we can't control and that's called sales. We can influence sales, but we just can't control it. And I spent many months back in the day when I was running my studio, always wait, waiting and hoping that it was gonna come back like the good old days and it never, never came back. And I got stuck with, shall we say, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And so the decision points for companies become very important. But let's talk about some of the strategies for what should a live action company do and what would be some thoughts for how they can, how they can respond. Okay, sure. Um, let's talk about projects that are being canceled, or canceled and being canceled. So let's just start with that. Um, if you do have contracts in place, there are most likely some phrases, as Diana pointed out, um, that allow for cancellation or in, in the time of cancellation. Um, if, if the contract you have is with a large corporation, it's possible that corporation carries insurance. So don't be afraid of what it means for you and your relationship and as if it's coming out of their pocket directly. Uh, a lot of these corporations have insurance for these reasons and um, that insurance should be covering some of those costs. Um, so read your cancellation clause, be very proactive with that client. Uh, maybe I should say this, be very graceful with that client first, uh, gracious with that client first, in that recognize there's an opportunity maybe to postpone that live action shoot. And though it might kind of put a little bit of crunch on you in the meantime, if you can move that shoot to a future date, there might be an opportunity in, in that engagement of post moment to ask for your fee up front. Say, hey, I know we've, we've engaged together. We have this cancellation clause. Instead of exercising the entire cancellation clause, can we just receive our fee for, for the live action portion of it, the production fee for it, and leave the costs that are accrued to a, a later date, two or three weeks out from now. If nothing happens in two or three weeks, we will open up the cancellation clause and basically pursue the rest of it. So have that conversation with your client to recognize uh, or to put out there first that you're being proactive, you're thinking through some scenarios, that there's a part that you are and could be does, that you can collect today and then the rest can be wait for a later date. Um, cancellation isn't easy. You're gonna have to approve some things and some of you might not have a cancellation clause. Some of there you just had the idea that you're gonna do a shoot and, and get paid for it afterward and you didn't receive any money up front or weren't entitled to any money up front. Um, if that's the case, I would, I would strategically as a business owner start moving those 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 funds off the table completely and just see where you are as a business recognize that money that those projects might not ever come back and if they do it's a brand new project for you and the timing is going to be new and the deliverables are going to be new and the costs are going to be new so uh, don't try to retain them if they're not if you're there if you're unable to retain them don't try to hold on to them too tight and uh, do as joel advised like let it not deal with reality and hold on to and keep accruing debt, hoping it's going to show up. I'd rather have you deal with the current reality. Um, if you're, that's if you, with projects you have in place, if you're dealing with projects that um, are future goal oriented, um, I'm, I'm imagining that some of my clients that have a series of projects they're supposed to deliver and they're a quarter of the way through those deliverables. So there's the remaining of those deliverables. Um, um, I, to me, I'd be working directly with that client and start negotiating a new payment terms, new contract terms, and new delivery terms, even with the thought of maybe modifying those deliverables so it's something you can do while in lockdown or in smaller groups. Um, yes. Something else I was going to suggest to you, Tim, is there's this, this idea that a project is defined and if a client calls you and says, well, we need to postpone it or just terminate where it's at, that the conversation's over. Like, oh, it's just done. And I think it's always interesting to ask, okay, I understand that you need to make this change. Um, if you don't mind, help me understand what's behind this. Because sometimes there's answers that arise that the client hasn't thought of, and it's an opportunity for you to offer leadership. It could be something as simple as, hey, we've only shot a quarter of the footage, but we can build something we can pull the, the spot that you need with what we've got or we can use the footage we shot from last year's campaign to make something using what we've shot this year plus last year it's just an opportunity to have a conversation called has the need just completely evaporated 
or are you just afraid and therefore you're just saying we don't know and cancel and it's always a, it's always just good to have a conversation and and have bookmarked future conversations with those clients we always love the future conversations that's future sales for you yeah um can we turn this uh over to the to the attendees is there um i see someone's raised their hand i think yeah. but is there anyone out there that wants to kind of give us a specific scenario Katwo, say hello to us oh nope. may have gone offline well, we, anybody else that want to raise their hand uh, and jump in here? I know, uh, is Sarah here from, uh, from the, let's see, nope, she's not with us today. I know she had a question about live action yesterday that we didn't get to. Um, if anyone else wants to jump, jump in and, and ask a question, just raise your hand or drop a, a question. Diana, I'm, I'm curious if, if this is helpful to you and the question that you dropped in the Q&A because, what I said is not necessarily all that helpful in terms of, it's not about just finding the right phrase to put in your contract. Um, because as, as Tim and I have been saying here, they may or may not honor that contract. If they don't, what are your options realistically? You can complain a lot, you can go to court, but that's not really gonna help you get through this crisis. So I, I think it's better to say, okay, what are the what ifs of if this cancels? What if this postpones? But the reality is what's under your control? And what's under your control is frankly your payroll and a lot of your, your indirect expenses. And those things that we can control, we just have to take an honest look and create a cash flow. I mean, Tim, this is something you and I talked about showing folks maybe tomorrow or, or next week is this, how can we gain some visibility into the future so we see when do I need to make these decisions? Yeah. So uh, Diana uh, followed up the conversation. What language should we include in SOW for cancellation fees? Um, so what we're looking for in that cancellation language is um, uh, one is in, in normal conditions, there is always uncertainty that we're dealing with and both parties want the ability to cancel a contract. So because of unforeseen items or just you know the reality of uh, business changing, um, both parties need to be able to say like the way this contract is currently written um, is not worth completing or not worth finishing. And depending on which party cancels the contract would give the other party certain rights or abilities. Um, the ones that you want to receive in your SOW, so the, the terms that you want to receive in your SOW are basically a, at least a guarantee to pay you out your expenses. So under, under certain conditions, this one would be and is argued to be right now force majeure, which basically is, you know, um, issues beyond our control. Um, so issues beyond our control, like a government shutdown, um, what are our rights that the client needs to pay you or is open to paying you if this doesn't go through? Um, and number one you want to have is any outside costs that you have put out on their behalf. Um, and, and I say on their behalf specifically because you wouldn't have hired that outside group or done that work if you weren't asked to do it by that client. So that client's risk in engaging you begins that and their version of the cancellation clause recognizes that they, they are engaging you and they owe you for those costs. Um, in some cases, in traditional cases, we used to be able to also get half of the budget or the cost, whichever is greater. If that's a possibility in your contract where you can at the very beginning um, act out now or in the new engagements be able to say, hey, in order to do this, you need, we need to receive half the money and that half the money is guaranteed to us upfront. It's not, we, don't, it's not, we don't need to return it to you if in the case of a cancellation. Um, um, or if we spend more than half that money, we would give you an additional invoice. Um, those are the kind of propositions you're looking for in your SOW, but really it's a negotiation, right? Um, different industries with different clients at different levels are going to have more flexibility to guarantee you those results. Um, um, and then Diana, if you're asking, should we get paid up front to do production as much as possible, especially because a lot of our obligation in live action comes up front. Um, our payment terms are shorter than the net 30, next 60 that happens in other areas of business. 
So we want to make sure that we can cover those short-term costs right away. So if we're creating engagement on behalf of our clients that require shorter term payouts, they need to give us the money so we can do that on their behalf. You are in that case, really a contractor, a person that's floating that money through your business and giving it to others. And you want to guarantee those payments are being uh, paid out because of, because the first liability is yours. Then the second liability is the client's. So you want to make sure your credibility and your liability is covered when you engage um, in live action on behalf of that. Um, I'm, I, the, the other thing I'm, I want to, I'm, I'm curious about Joel is this, it seems like there's contradictions in our, the way the government is rolling out these restrictions. So there's recommendations um, like the one I've heard is 10 or less, um, um, but state by state. So federally, it seems like it's a recommendation 10 or less within my state of Oregon. It's a, it's no greater than 10 people. Um, but I've heard in other regions that you could meet in larger groups. Um, you are allowed to meet at work. So I, I read nearly an apology. This is where I got the idea of some of the previous conversation of guilt, but nearly an apology by Google when they wrote this idea of like, hey, by the way, we kind of do need to have people at work to keep the Google Plex going. And we're gonna have a minimum staff and, and those people are gonna uh, do best practices to keep themselves you know, out of harm. But we have to kind of go to work to keep, the, keep Google moving. Um, I feel like we're asking that same question in, in, in live action. I would almost be curious if that's a question and a proposition we can put out there for our clients and be able to say, hey, we know that the restrictions on meeting are 10 or less. We've decided to create new practices. Um, we'll call it like uh, safe practices or, or safe engagements between us and our crew. We're limiting our crew to only the people that need to be available that crew have been, you know, hopefully tested in, in the future of the tests available, or at least basically practicing these certain recommended practices. So when we show up together, we believe that we're not passing the virus between us, but we can still get your work done. And to be able to write out those rules of engagement to understand that it's there, that you're doing your due diligence to make it happen, and you can meet requirements using that minimum structure, I believe there is still work out there for live action. We might just have to think through what the protocols are to get there. But yeah. I'd be curious if, if how people would feel if they implemented those protocols, if they believe they can get people to show up. I think that's a really interesting question. And here's why I think it's maybe interesting is when you think about the long term. I know we're just in crisis mode, but I'm already starting to think about what's life going to be like three months, six months, 12 months from now. And if there's the possibility that this virus is not a vaccine, maybe it's not a, a traditional remedy. If this, uh, if this virus comes and goes, maybe a year from now, what if it pops up in India? What if a year from now it pops up in South America or something, right? And maybe we have to just deal with it. Clearly, there's going to be some sort of set of policies or guidelines that we as businesses will use to interact with each other. So the question becomes, is somebody going to step up and innovate, right? Will AICT, perhaps, could they be called upon to formulate some sort of practical guidelines for we still want, we still need to get work done, but there is a yeah. safe way to do this. <clears throat> and maybe that does create an opportunity for those of us that step up and figure that out. And, and then I also have the question of liability. What if, what if a gaffer comes on to my crew and even though we were less than 10 people, he was sick and now he got other people sick. Is he liable for something? I don't know. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I think those are the things that we don't currently have in place in the government and in insurance policies. And in a way, like I feel like some of this reaction is to say, oh, we're not prepared. We don't know who's liable in a situation. We don't even know who's caring in situation. So we're, um, we're looking to protect people from blame and, and have a social contract within our economy that allows for things to take place. And the, the, like the pieces that Grace needed to function regardless of contagion that happens out there. Um, but I, but I do like this concept might sound kind of funny, but like we, there's this idea of safe sex and we know what that means. We know what that safety practice is 
and that's passing one um, virus or bacteria onto another person. So there's clearly an understanding, a global or, or, or at least a, a social understanding of what that would be like. In a way, like I just wonder what might safe engagement be like in business? So what is required minimum? How do people have to practice to be in, a, in the core group during a situation like this in a core group together where everyone's committing and almost contracting with each other to follow certain principles and practices and not go out of those practices. And if so, you can be part of this core group and it's a safe group. It's a safe cloistered group of people, five, six, seven, eight, nine people that can get work done. Yeah. Um, I think there's something in that Joel that allows um, people to start practicing again and to use some language that gives comfort to the clients and comfort to society, avoid the shame, avoid the guilt and getting work done. Because like I said, Google saying basically like we have to work. I kind of want you guys to recognize that you can say, use the same words. Well, we're about uh, two minutes from this second half hour uh, when we're going to wrap things up. I thought it might be good just to mention this Q&A that came in from Jan at Think Mojo. Um, Jan said he had to bounce, but he wants to watch the replay later. So we got to remember to get these replays up. But he said, what can we expect from our production insurances? And I thought, you can expect, expect them to fulfill their obligations. I mean, that they're in the business of bringing remedies when these, if these things happen. So what beyond that would you say, Tim, that you can expect? Well, yeah, I would. One, let's look at our insurance policies to see if there's force majeure, the ability for cancellation. Uh, hopefully you have some of that in place for projects that already got started. It's rare to have that in place if you haven't started a project. Um, but let's just look through that. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lawyers that are busy out there solving these problems, but reach out to your lawyer and ask what your rights are in that process and begin filing that paperwork to get there. Be first in line if there is something to put out there. Um, but in the long run, Jan, I'd also say like expect production insurance to have new clauses in there. I'm, in fact, for, uh, force majeure might be taken out of a lot of situations in the future, or there'll be exceptions to pandemics. Because uh, insurance po policies obviously can't be paying this thing out every 12 months with the latest virus that comes. Um, so in the future, it's probably going to cost us more if we want to insure against something like this. Um, or it's going to be removed altogether. So just start expecting that. And that's why I think in practical reality, the thing that you can control is how you practice your day-to-day -day work and how you position yourself in the marketplace to be a safe environment for people. Um, how you deal with people that are infected with COVID or whatever it comes up in the future so that you have a, a method and a process to deal with that. Obviously not avoiding shame, but to, to know that that is a concern for others and you can protect one another from that. Um, uh, that's great. You know, really, Joel, I just wanted to start the conversation. I, I know there, um, this, we identified live action, but there are probably more smaller segments that are dealing with um, drastic shutdown. Um, we have a, a client that only does live events. Like that's all they do is live events. So you can imagine from Coachella to the Democratic National Convention, nothing is happening in those areas and those adjustments and what those projects are and how they're going to deal with um, their future. And that segment is small as well. Um, and we're giving them similar advice. I don't think we have all the answers. And I just want to be honest with you. I, Joel and I are processing out loud wondering what the questions are and thinking through solutions. Um, but we really want to hear what your concerns are. What is sitting on your desk and, and are there specific things that we can help you process? We'd be very open to it. Um, so thanks for just having this conversation with us. And we wanted to just open up something for you all directly that you know that our thoughts are with you and we know the stress is real. Um, we, we are going to start opening up RevThink um, conversations, one-on-one -on -one and group conversations, and we'll keep you posted. Um, in the next few days or early next week, we might open up another conversation about live action or short-term engagements uh, that'd be relevant to you. So just stay on the, stay within our channels. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm going to just do a quick uh, mention. This There's a separate live stream tomorrow, so um, I'll, I'll just bring up this little screen here so you can see it. So Tim and I are going to actually walk through uh, give you a, some of the concepts, like what are the actual strategies for proactively running your creative firm? And these apply to good times, not just bad times. 
Um, so that'll happen tomorrow. It's at a different time. So just watch the Slack channel. Uh, if there's, if you have questions, if you want, if you're looking for the link, it's in the, in the chat here in Zoom. But Tim, thanks for jumping on this call today and answering some of the questions around live action. I can't wait to tomorrow. We're going to really go through some of the principles and bigger ideas that I hope will inspire people. Yeah, this conversation tomorrow, um, too, I think we're going to talk about some of the timing issues that people are dealing with. So um, stay up to speed on the channels and listen in. Thank you all for being part of this. We appreciate you supporting one another and being part of this community. You are all great, and you are making a difference. Um, I can see it happening in the numbers. So thanks for sacrificing on, on behalf of the greater good and dealing with the stress on behalf of one another in the community and your employees that are depending on you. We really do appreciate you doing this for them. And keep those song suggestions coming. We'll pick one here shortly and we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joel.